welcome Stephen Rehaj, one of the. Who's coming this uh, this time? Uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Duran Duran, Flaming Lips, Wu Tang Clan, um, <laughs> Kings of Leon, one of my favorite bands. Uh, then we just added a whole New Orleans section, which is the original Meters. Uh, it's actually New Orleans and the um, influences of New Orleans music from the Caribbean. So Ozo Motley, Kinky, Yerba Buena, Meters, Emma Thomas, a bunch of great stuff. You, um, you grew up around here, right? Grew up on St. Claude Avenue. That's close by, isn't yeah. it? And um, went to school at LSU? I did. And uh, what was your, when did you graduate? from Finance. Ah, uh, that helps, huh? Nothing to do with the music. So how did you get into this business, promoting concerts and doing voodoo? Um, just created it. You know, grew up in the, the back end of the quarter and loved music and had a passion for it. And you know, had every Led Zeppelin album on vinyl surrounding my bed. And, you know, <laughs> my entire bed and the living in my bedroom was surrounded by records. And you know, more of a fan perspective. So we started a company that is more of a hired gun. We produced technically for a bunch of larger corporations. So the, the event that you mentioned, the Revlon Run Walk, every year we shut down Times Square between 42nd Street and 59th on 7th and Broadway, which is unheard of. We're the only people that are allowed to shut down Times Square. And it's a 12-hour, literally a military operation, you know, because everything's linear. So all the trucks have to be perfectly aligned. And you know, the next morning, 50,000 people show up for this race. and Every you know, every year at 6:30 in the morning, every billboard in Times Square goes dark, and it comes back up on our satellite feed. And it's just like the only time of the year that you have Times Square. It's just one big, gigantic visual. So we do more stuff like that, and then voodoo, particularly. You know, it's sort of an anomaly in this day and age that you know one person owns a music festival and is dumb enough to actually do a music festival and take the risk that we take with this event. So. so how do you go about getting clients like, like the Revlon Run Walk thing? How does that happen? Um, was it your interest that caused that, or is it their interest that they hire you? Well, we started a business here. The, the business actually started in New Orleans with uh, three tours. They were interactive tours, and quite honestly, I think that was probably the best way to learn the business because we had no resources, and they were very interactive. And like insanely intense productions, which was uh, the first one was an event called Planet Hoops. And the way that I started the company was working in New York for a production company, and um, the final four was in New Orleans. And you know, Planet Hoops' name is now sort of dated and you know old school, but when it came out, it was you know pre uh, pre Planet Hollywood and. Planet Reebok and all the crap that came mm -hmm. after it. Um, so essentially launched the company by talking the mayor into giving us, I, I walked in and asked for uh, Decatur Street in the French Quarter to put up all of these basketball courts. We can do like a thousand basketball courts and have a three on three tournament. And uh, he threw me out the office and then I went <laughs> back and got the convention center and the, the warehouse area. And essentially took the site between the hotels and the Superdome, and then took that to Adidas and to Miller and to all the sponsors. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge success, and we took it on the road and created a football version of it called In the Zone and a volleyball version called Spike, and then other companies just started hiring us. That's incredible. So you just, uh, I mean, that worked out for you, that Planet Hoops thing, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it really did. So it must be easier now dealing with uh, with the logistics and the agents and all that. I mean, they take your calls. They don't hang up on you. They don't curse at you and scream anymore. Well, they still curse and scream a lot. There's probably a few of them on my phone right now, cursing and screaming. But um, they do take the phone calls. Well, that's good. They also take the checks. <laughs> do you see yourself staying in the business? Where do you see yourself in five years? Wow, well, I don't know. Bigger and better? I think Voodoo will, you know, the, the goal of Voodoo has always been 
you know, to be around for 30 years and have the economic impact that Jazz Fest has on the city. You know, I think a lot of things have changed over the last year, and you know, we need to see how this year goes and see how the city goes and what political structure happens in the city and what's the environment. But we plan on, you know, obviously we did a, we came back and did a free show 60 days after last year, and we came back this year with what I think is an incredible lineup. So, but this is your biggest one, though, right? This is your, this is going to be the biggest festival of them all, right? Of all the voodoo fests that you've done. I think it will be, yeah. And you do, it's not your only major event. In fact, the Revlon event would probably be bigger, right? The Revlon event is a much more insane production. I mean, this we have two weeks in the park that we can go build and, you know, once it gets out there, they're two very different environments. You know, the Revlon event is literally 12 speakers, you know, three <coughs> bands, and we're coordinating all the talent and the production, and, you know, it's a whole different beast. You know, we just finished a tour, the La Maximo tour, uh, which is a 12-city Latin tour. Hmm. Um, and we've got the Road to Voodoo going on right now, so. 42 events in 53 days. Really? Wow. <coughs> That's a lot of work. You need any help? Yeah. <laughs> so go to the website and Call sign me. up, right? So you were telling me earlier about what, the, what <clears throat> you had to go through just to get the permission to do the uh, event um, from, the, from the neighborhood committees. How did that work out? I mean, how did, they, how did you pick your spot, and how did you get permission to do it there? Well, I think for everybody that's from New Orleans in the last you know, year, it's been a little chaotic. So. Last year, we got hit with the storm exactly 60 days before the event. We ended up having three options to go to Miami, Austin, and uh, Memphis. And we decided to go to Memphis, relocated everything there. And we were three weeks out and decided it was just, you know, didn't feel right. It's like one of those things that, you know, you can go to class and you can, you know, study what you want to study. And it's not a very scientific business on that side of it. And we were going through a walkthrough and it just said, you know, this doesn't feel right. We need to go back to New Orleans. So I got Megan on the phone and he said, I'm not going to tell you yes. I'm not going to tell you no, but give it a shot. So, you know, came back. We did the free show here at Audubon Park. <clears throat> did roughly 32,000 people, half of them carrying machine guns. Um, <laughs> and fatigues, I hope. So, yeah. So this year we were determined to go back to City Park and we had a board meeting scheduled at 4 o'clock so I went out there at like 1 and thought, you know, check out the site, go back, take a shower, go to the board meeting and I walked into the board meeting and I was like, we just, we don't have the resources to deal with what I'm looking at. You know, the park's in terrible condition, there's FEMA trailers all over the place. So at the end of it, uh, we walked out and the symphony was playing for free uh, right on the museum steps and uh, asked the park, I was like, a little small, but if I can make it work, can we can we use this? And he's like, you'll never get it through the neighborhood associations. So we called all four neighborhood associations together, ordered about three cases of vodka, <laughs> made the presentation about an hour and a half into the vodka, <laughs> and essentially, you know, gave them the choice of saying, you know, there's no other sites left, you know, in New Orleans right now. We put the Chili Peppers on the stage at eight o'clock on Saturday night. They're going to blow the doors down the corridor of Esplanade to the French Quarter. The entire city is going to hear it. We'll probably blow out windows. And if you know that's something that you're not interested in, you know, veto it. If it's something you think the city needs at this point in time to remind people what's going on down here, let's go for it. And we got all four votes. Thank God. That's amazing. Can you maybe describe the beginning stages of? Uh, you said you just created the festival, uh, like. Can you maybe describe the beginning stages of it, and also how did you, if, if you know, you did start off with major acts, how did you attract those major acts to such a new festival? God, that's going to be a politically incorrect story. You were trying to avoid that, <laughs> weren't you? <laughs> um, like I said, we, you know, technically we have a very tight production team, and. You know, it was just something growing up here that, you know, I wanted to do. And it took me about two years to actually pull it together. But 
a competitor, a local promoter here, and I, I was dumb enough to call everybody and say, this is what I want to do, you know, not realizing that they were all going to try to put me in the trunk of the car. Um, the true story was that, you know, I called the guy and he basically was yelling and screaming at me and um, I asked him about an event that was going on that weekend and made a racial slur that, you know, I don't do those type of events. And the um, second question was, what about Jazz Fest? And he's like, well, they've been around for 30 years. I let them make their money. So I hung up the phone, and I was like pacing back and forth for about 15 minutes. It's like steam coming out of my ear that someone would actually say that. It was a, a really rude statement. And then I figured uh, right after that, if they didn't do, you know, quote, unquote, those type of events, they probably didn't have the relationships in those areas. So my favorite artist at the time was uh, the Fugees and Wycliffe and, um, had just come out with the carnival. So I found that agent, called her every day for 30 days. The 30, 31st day, she actually picked up the phone. Can you curse on me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cara, Cara Lewis is her name, now one of my best friends, but she's <coughs> this like, crazy Jewish lady who says, why in the f are you calling me every day? You're not in the goddamn fucking music business. Why would I give you my biggest artist, you stupid son of a bitch? Da, da, da. <laughs> oh, my. You said curse? Oh, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> so I listened to that for like 30 seconds, and I was like, Kara, I'm going to do this thing. Somebody's going to take the money. You know, I know we're going to overpay the first year to get it done. You might as well do it. Your artist's going to be asking. And um, she said, all right, this is a deal. I'll charge you double. And she's still yelling at this point. I'll charge you double his normal price. I want the money wired 100% within the hour and hung up the phone on me. Whoa. Big chunk of money. So now I'm scrambling. My assistant's on the phone with her assistant getting the wire information. I'm calling the bank, and I'm on my hands and knees going, I know you have no idea what I'm doing, but just wire this money. No, I don't have a contract. I don't even know where it's going. And <laughs> this might be going to the Caribbean in our bank. And the money hit her account. The banker, thank God, to this day did it. The money hit her account uh, in 44 minutes. She picked up the phone on, you know, 45 minutes later and said, all right, you got Wycliffe, you got the roots. Call so-and-so in L.A. Again, excuse my language, but you f*** this thing up. You'll never work again in the music business, and I will personally come looking for you. <laughs> That's how Voodoo started. <laughs> Don't try that at home. <laughs> Just the way we drew it up on the board. That's funny. How do you pick your talent? How did you pick the talent this year? Um, the way we do it every year. Just by, you know, who we feel like listening to. That's cool. There's, there's no committee. There's no... I was surprised to see Nick here. Nick worked in the office for three months last summer. Um, so he knows it's a, it's a very small office, very small group of people. And uh, we don't really do anything scientific-wise. It's just like, you know, anybody feel like seeing the chili peppers this year? Yeah. <laughs> well, so how do you get the chili peppers? I mean, they're not making a southern tour, are they? <clears throat> they were not. They, um, I think they have an affinity for New Orleans. You know, there's a couple songs that they cover, the Neville songs, and I think this year, we've, off the record, they're supposed to close their set with the meters. Um, they did a song on the first record, um, which they changed the chorus to, Take Me Back to Hollywood. Uh, it's the original meter song, Take Me Back to Africa. Huh. So we're working on that collaboration. Um, we got a little bit lucky with them in that their entire tour was in the Northeast. And the way the business works, and for a band like that, you you wait and you get the uh, Madison Square Garden date. It's the hardest date, the hardest venue to book. So everything's booked around New York. So their weekend was the 21st, which they thought our date was. Uh, so when I saw the schedule come out right before I was literally going to press, I called the agent and was like, what are you doing? Why aren't you coming to New Orleans? And he said, I thought it was the 21st. Give me four hours, I'll reroute everything. So they canceled like five shows, 
at Atlanta and then I'm coming down here just specifically to play New Orleans. So it's terrific. Very cool of them. Has anybody ever figured out the, the economic impact of the festival on the local community? Um, that would have to be dealing with the politics side of it, so I avoid that like the plague. Oh, yeah. yeah. All I know is we sell out every airport, every plane flight down here, and every hotel. But that's still like a pretty significant impact. We leave that to the <coughs> administration to figure out. So when do you start working on the event? <coughs> I mean, do you start when you finish the one before the one? I mean, you right away yeah. into the next one. Yeah. Well, this year, you know, we essentially we started working on the talent and the wish list, and then. You know, I looked at Jazz Fest and what was the energy behind that, what happened with Mardi Gras, and I thought both of those were positive for the city. So that's when we really pulled the trigger on locking everybody in. How many people are involved in the operation? How many people does it take to put on a festival like that? On year round, believe it or not, there's only four people that work on the, the marketing and the booking of it. Um, once we get to the event, there's about 1,200 people on staff. Where do you go about uh finding 1,200 employees, you know, to just take a part-time shift or whatever? There's a uh, company that we use locally. Um, it, it depends on whatever city you're in. Uh, New Orleans is not a big union city. Um, typically, you would go to the union crews, and, you know, there are very crazy restrictions, like in New York. You know, you can move the crate to this point, but you can't actually move it off of the truck, and they'll tell you how many people you need to hire. Um, that's when it's a little more difficult in trying to figure that out in advance when you're budgeting an event so you don't get hit on the backside with the big labor bills. In New Orleans, we actually just use the company called West Staff, which is, you know, they have a crew here. They do all the conventions, and you can sign up on their website. Uh, you mentioned before that you do a little bartering with the uh, groups and things, uh, the companies that sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, how do they deal with with the copyrights and performance rate type things, do they company the companies deal with that, or they do they sign a waiver for it, or you know, it's in it's in our riders. Um, I learned the hard way the first year that I started this event that you know we signed all the contracts as CAA and William Morris and everybody sent over and we put everybody up in hotel rooms and you know got billed back for all their porn bills and all of that kind of fun <laughs> stuff that you. Know, you figure out, you know, that you don't do the next year. So we essentially wrote a writer, a contract, our own writer that says our writer overrides your writer, <laughs> <laughs> and we win. Um, and in that, there are certain media rights that they have to deliver to us to play the festival. Um, for the bigger bands, it's a case by case basis, and it's a little bit of a fire drill on event day, trying to get you know so and so cleared for MTV or cleared for this one. And it's more of a specific, you know, what are you going to use this for? You know, the, the website of it, I think, you know, three years ago, everybody was a little scared of it. Now I think, it, you know, everybody does get it and know that for the most part it's non downloadable and it goes away in 30 days. So, you know, they're not scared of, you know, giving it to a PlayStation for, you know, a 30 day run on their website. When you get when people come on the stage on the stage or they actually appear, are all your eyes dotted and T's crossed? You've got all the contracts together, or is there always some things that that don't get done? Um, on event day, yeah. So the the contracts are all signed. Um, you know, it's a, we've got it down to a system now where deposits go out at a certain time and the contracts are signed and executed. The biggest ones are the television, you know, content rights, and specifically who's looking for those content rights. You know, it's a little bit of a fire drill because you'll have Radio Row that'll consist of, you know, 200 radio stations from around the country that are all looking to broadcast and looking for certain interviews. Then you'll have the MTVs and, you know, believe it or not, MTV, MTV2, VH1 are all the same family, but they bicker and fight. And, they all want exclusive content, and then there's AOL. So there's a lot of managing that process of who we allow to get to the right people to sign. And the way that we've kind of wrapped our head around it is created festival services 
where we shoot everything ourselves. Our production team shoots every minute. We've shot in every second of uh, Voodoo, with the exception of three bands, all of which Maynard plays in Tool, Perfect Circle. Um, just wouldn't allow any kind of taping at all. But other than that, we've got every second of Voodoo covered. That's amazing. And so you learned this by just doing it. You learned the whole concert production business by just doing it? Did you intern with somebody that taught you? Or? Um, my first job I started with um, a, a woman named Karen Thomas who actually started the Essence Festival here right. in New Orleans. Uh, but I worked with her in New York, so my first show that I ever did was the Cancun Jazz Festival. Mm -hmm. um, technically, you know, production is production. I think, you know, on a scale of this size, it's all about relationships with one the booking agents, you know, you have to have that trust factor and there's literally like five booking agents that can make or break a festival of this type, um, you know, that have the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Pearl Jams of the world. And the other side of it is the sponsorship side of it and, you know, how creative can you be in integrating the sponsorship, you know, it's a, it's a new world, it's a new medium and, you know, without selling out a, an event. How can you package things that are that add value to the festival goers? You know, I think ten years ago it was you know go wrap the oak tree or put up the coke sign, and now it's really how do you add value to the people that are buying tickets to the event? Hmm. Well, that's that's fascinating. So, what's the biggest problem you have to solve with respect to it? Uh, with in what aspect? Like the, is it is it just the production of the show itself, or is it? politics of it? Is it the, the venue itself? It's a moving target. It's everything. You know, I think that's part of, you know, why I like doing what I do. It's, you, you know, there's so many elements of it. You know, basically you can break it down into marketing, production, and management. And after that, you've got all your subsets on, you know, that fall under those categories. Um, but, you know, Nick will tell you the laundry list on this event, you know, those a 300 page binder that we've learned through you through the years of everything that goes into it and we document it pretty well and you know the thousand college radio stations that are on our email network that are getting radio talking points and it's you know all of this kind of crazy stuff that goes into the marketing the marketing side of it is really the the most labor intensive the booking side is probably the hardest to actually confirm and you handle all this in house yeah Marketing too. Yeah. Wow. Would you have a marketing budget that you that you set, or you just flow with it as you need it? For the most part, we do it all on trade. Um, so you know, college radio stations need content. Radio stations need content. A lot of the web content uh, providers and sponsors are now looking for content, video content. So what you're seeing in the sponsorship world is people like AT and T looking for material for their own website, like mm -hmm. the Blue Room. So they're looking to clip one song from every artist in the festival, and you know it's a strange time in dealing with you know sponsorships and labels and trying to coordinate all of that. So, so you don't all the marketing <coughs> is done with trading, bartering the the contents of the festival. Ninety percent of it. That's yeah. fascinating. What do you find as the uh, um, the most important thing to think about when you're trying to deal with someone and trying to work out a contract. It seems like you've, you've come a lot of, over a lot of difficult obstacles in getting things from people, getting permission to do things, getting artists. How, how do you go about doing that with a person? Dealing with a person one-on-one -on -one and, um, and getting past barriers that people set in front of you, say, no, you can't do this. How, how do you get past that, like both in your head and with them? We, we just don't accept barriers. <laughs> I don't know how you get past it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but, you know, with Voodoo, like last year, and, you know, if you were in our office and know the chaos that we went through, I think, you know, you have to say that, you know, I'm going to run this thing by a spreadsheet or I'm going to run it by my instincts. And this project in particular, we run by instinct. and. You know, it's something that, you know, you question why you would come back to New Orleans this year. And if you're from New Orleans, you know that, you know, it's going to take events like this. It's going to take, you know, events like Jazz Fest and Essence and Mardi Gras and those type of things to keep happening. 
So, you know, whatever you do in life, you're going to end up having people say no. Just don't listen to them. Don't take no for an answer, huh? You've already got that, trying for a yes. You get a lot of no's, you know. It is what it is. Well, if there's somebody in this room that wants to promote a show or start, start doing what you do, would you give them, what advice would you give them? Go to law school. Like or Dell school? <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's a business that you have to have the stomach for. Um, there's a lot of risk, and we actually get hired, we get hired a lot of times by corporations that want to do tours, and they don't understand the mechanisms that go behind a tour. You know, they say, you know, it'd be great to take X band and put them in 20 cities, and you know, it's easy. You get a tour bus, and they stop at every venue, and they do this, and they do that, and you know, we buy some ads in the paper, and you know, for the most part, no one ever sees the downside of the business, the, the risk that goes into this business. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, my phone calls get taken today. They get taken today because I lost $752,000 of money I didn't have the first year, and everybody got paid. So, you know, I figured out a way to, you know, get the bank to loan me the money and to get all the bands paid and to get all the production people paid. So. Now there's a comfort level with what we do, and there's a trust factor with the people that we work with, and we've worked with the same production teams and the same people over and over and over. So, you know, it goes back to relationships. And as far as promoting a show, you know, you have to know the upsides and the downsides. And the strictly a promoter-driven promoter show at this point in time is sort of like owning an ad agency. You know, the artists are always going to do an 85-15 split, so I don't think the business really lends itself. Live music right now doesn't really lend itself to being a good business model. You're still doing it if you're clear channel and you can buy a tour, but that's why you're seeing those bigger companies doing it, because what happens is, the promoter is taking all of the 100% of the risk, and once you get to break even, whatever that number is that you agree on break even, then the artist takes 85% of that, and the promoter takes 15% of that, which is a dumb business model in my perspective, mm -hmm. and we don't, we're not in that business, um, so I wouldn't recommend it. Oh well, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the advice, Steve. Um, I think some people won't take that advice, though. <clears throat> I mean, I hope they won't. So uh, that they'll actually try to maybe change that model and make it a different model. I think the model does have to change, and if it's on a smaller level, like you know, two of our favorite people that work in the office that are Loyola grads, Heather O'Brien and Mike Carty, you know, had uh, the worst name of any production company ever, Rusty Productions, which I didn't meant that they didn't, they were rusty at it. I didn't know where the name <laughs> came from, but um, I know they did a bunch of shows in college and were very successful, but they were working with people like Big Sam, who is friendly and, you mm -hmm. know, working with the right artist. It's, you know, not getting caught up with the CAA William Morris model where they're just there to make the most money for their, their artist and not worrying about the long-term ramifications of your business. Mm -hmm. so.